Hey guys. So today we are going to be taking a look at the what began um, the, uh, the United States. And so we're going to do a brief review of European exploration as well as the introduction into the 13 English colonies and how they were divided into regions. So first thing focus is early exploration. So the pursuit of the new world. What led European countries into the new world? So some of the major reasons, and you might recall this last year from World 2, are the three Gs, gold, glory, and God. Um, gold being that first general idea. Uh, many European countries were seeking wealth out around the world um, and a sense of competition. Mercantilism um, was the sense of power in Europe. So the more colonies and resources you had coming into the mother country determined how much power you had amongst your peers within the European realm. And so many European countries started to seek expeditions around the world to be able to gather resources. So for the New World, of course, we associate with Christopher Columbus in 1492, as he discovered the New World, and at the time didn't even realize that he had discovered, essentially, quote, a new world. So just to kind of you know, give you a brief review, um, Spain is going to be the one to lead the early exploration of the New World. And a lot of that has to do with the Treaty of Tordesillas um, between Portugal and Spain. So they essentially took the globe, split it in half, and Portugal got the rights to explore and colonize the eastern side of the world, which left Spain the west. And so this is going to lead the Spanish to send conquistadors over into the New World and, as we know, are going to have major impacts on the native population, such as the Mayans and the Aztecs and even the Incas. Um, so that is kind of the pursuit of gold and even glory, as other European countries, such as France and England, are going to also start to pursue um, exploration of the New World. For a lot of them, it was a business venture. So we're going to talk a little bit more about Jamestown later on in this lecture. But Jamestown was an economic venture. It wasn't about setting up a permanent settlement um, to have an establishment necessarily in the New World, but to gain money. Many of the explorers and the Virginia Company who organized the expedition of Jamestown, the settlement of Jamestown, they were looking for gold. And they're going to be sadly mistaken and sadly surprised when they realize there's not an abundance amount of gold. But over time, they will find other resources of wealth. Looking at the other G, um, besides gold and glory, is the role of God. Um, many saw this as an opportunity to spread and teach, um, the, to convert individuals to the teachings of Christianity. And so as they encountered many of the native populations, they found them um, to be uncivilized, um, almost savage. And so they wanted to convert them to Christianity to save their souls. And so many times um, missionaries would go over to the New World. And oftentimes it was in regards with the Catholic religion, so many Catholic priests and Catholic missionaries, um, a lot of them of French descent and Spanish descent, were coming over to the New World. And so the gold, glory, and God are going to be the incentives um, to bring people to the New World. As you guys may recall also last year from World II is the Columbian Exchange. You know, when the settlers came to the New World, they brought many of their ideas, they brought their goods, they even brought their diseases with them and introduced them into the New World. Um, and so some of the um, new ideas and goods were very helpful. The diseases are going to be quite devastating. But also on the other side of that, we have the introduction of New World ideas. So New World um, agricultural, livestock, products, goods, and ideas that are also going to be brought over to the old world, which is what is considered in Europe and Africa. So these exchange of goods and ideas is going to have a lasting impact on the various regions of the world. So looking at, you know, kind of summarizing the impacts, as I mentioned before, exploration is going to have a devastating impact on the native populations within the new world in both North and South America. Between 70 and 80 percent of the native populations died, mostly from smallpox. They were not immune to the diseases that were there. Um, other problems is going to be the role of land. The European settlers dominated the Native Americans because of their uh, more sophisticated weaponry, and so this allowed them to be able to conquer and take the land. Now, each European country had a different outlook on the native populations, and they treated them differently. Um, the Spanish, for instance, uh, did conquer the native populations. They could be quite ruthless with them, but they lived amongst the native populations. They felt it was okay for 
uh, individuals of Spanish descent to marry um, and reproduce with Native American populations. And so it created a blended hierarchy system within Central and South America. Um, they also established the Encomendada system where um, Spanish settlers were in control of Native populations. Um, the English, on the other hand, did feel that it was not right to live amongst the Native um, population. So they did not marry and reproduce with the Native populations um, in the same sense that the Spanish did, which this also increased conflict amongst the English settlers and the Native populations because there was a sense of competition for the land. The French weren't looking to really establish permanent settlements like the English and the Spanish. The French were purely there for economic gain, and so they established um, relatively good relationships with the Native Americans because there wasn't a sense of competition for the land. They weren't looking to settle there, and they opened very lucrative trading arrangements with the Native populations. They were after um, furs in particular. The fur trade was quite lucrative for the French, um, beaver pelts in particular, and so this also helped the Native populations. And we'll see that positive relationship between the French and the Native Americans come back in the 1700s when we talk about the French and Indian War. Native Americans did attempt to try to resist the European takeover, but like I said before, their weapons were no match for the European weaponry. And so, in instance, many natives began to adopt the European customs, the farming techniques, and even their religion, um, starting to live amongst the European population. Since disease was such a devastating impact on the native populations, um, the European settlers needed a workforce. The native populations, Native Americans, were not seeming to be an effective workforce. They were dying because of disease, or if they were able to survive of disease, they were also able to escape. They knew the terrain. This is their homeland. So many European settlers tried to find a workforce that were not as susceptible um, or likely to die because of European diseases. They had more exposure, but also did not know the land. And so this is how slavery and the slave trade was introduced into the new world. Um, the first slaves arrived in Virginia in 1619 um, aboard some of the slave, uh, slave ships that were coming from Western Africa. Um, last year, you guys learned about the triangular trade between Europe, Western Africa, and the Americas. The middle leg or the middle part of the triangular trade is known as the Middle Passage. And that was the horrendous journey that enslaved individuals from West Africa had to travel on the bottom of ships all the way to the Caribbean, Central America, and into North America, into the colonies for work. Um, the West Africans were a strong labor force, but this is going to have a huge devastating impact on um, the African tribes of Western Africa, where they lose up towards 12 million of its fittest citizens and you know, forever changing their society and culture. But West Africans are gonna have a huge impact on American culture and American identity as their population continues to grow within the colonies. And there's also gonna be some major impacts of exploration on the European population. We see a large migration Many individuals took up the challenge of coming to the new world. They saw this as their opportunity for a better life or even an opportunity to get rich quick. You know, the idea of that gold and glory um, and even God, the three G's, seemed very compelling to many European citizens to take up that challenge. It also created a larger sense of competition amongst the European countries um, you know, to be able to get land grabs and land claims within North and South America. Um, increased conflict with the Native American populations, which is going to have a lasting impact on um, American culture and once the United States is established, but then also with the Colombian exchange, the exchange of food, animals, plants, and even ideas is forever gonna have a lasting impact, not only on Europe, but the world as we know it today. So this is just kind of briefly recapping your age of exploration from World II last year, kind of set the stage for what we know as the beginning of the United States. And so those English colonies that's gonna be started with Jamestown in 1607 is going to spread along the Eastern seaboard to create 13 colonies for the English um, in the beginning of what will become the United States. Now, we're not going to look at each individual of the 13 colonies within this lecture. You guys will actually get to dive into those more in class. What I'm going to focus on now are the regional distinctions. So of those 13 colonies, they're divided into three regions.
southern colonies, the New England colonies, and the middle colonies. And so anytime we start to classify things, we classify based on similarities and differences. And so that's what we're going to take a closer look at now. So the first region, and this is where if you have your note sheet, you're going to start to take some notes, is on the southern colonial region. And you'll notice there that it says economic ventures. This is where a majority of southern colonies were created and established purely for the purpose of economic gain, which is not going to be the case for some of the other regions. So within the southern region, we have five colonies that you know, create this particular region, starting with Maryland, then Virginia, the Carolinas, and then ending with Georgia. Now remember, Florida is not part of the 13 colonies. Florida was controlled by the Spanish, which is one of the reasons why Georgia is created as a buffer between the Spanish and the rest of the lucrative English colonies. The basic economy that establishes or defines the southern economy was an agricultural society. The land is quite rich in the, um, in the south. Uh, it's, you know, has really rich in nutrients, great for cultivation, and so the plantation system was set up. Um, it came from the head rights system, which granted uh, 50 acres of land to anyone who could pay their way to the colony. So um, many wealthy individuals started to buy up large parts of land. They'd send people over to work it because they could reap the benefits and not necessarily move on their own. Plantations were often set up along the river systems. Um, so as they arrive, they're going to be very close to the coastline so that they're able to ship their products. Um, be able to export. Most of the plantations were on the coast, so that was your wealthy area. The more you moved to the interior, the less wealthy you were because you were further away from the natural harbors and the river systems to be able to ship your goods. Cash crops definitely did um, uh, become the main source of income. Uh, tobacco is not going to be the first major um, cash crop. Tobacco eventually will become, you know, is kind of referred to as uh, brown gold. Um, it was extremely wealthy, became very popular over in Europe and high demand. But rice and indigo are going to be some of the major ones and sugar as well before tobacco really takes hold. Oftentimes when we think of cash crops and plantations, we think of cotton, but that's not going to be until the 1800s. So initially in the 1600s and 1700s, the major cash crops will be tobacco, rice, indigo, and sugar. Within the inland, like I said, the more you move to the interior of the land, um, the less wealthy you were. And so this is more subsistence farming. Subsistence farming means that you farm enough to take care of your family and make a little profit. Plantations were purely for profit. You also thrived off of hunting, so local hunting and trading, particularly amongst the native populations. Those who lived in the interior were mostly former indentured servants, and we'll talk about the role of indentured servants here in a moment. This is an image of a plantation, just to give you a general idea, and this is an indigo plant. So those of you who've never seen an indigo plant, um, the buds there off the plant are um, smashed and it creates a purple dye, and it was in high demand back in Europe um, to, you know, for the um, current fashion trends. Continuing with the economy of the South, um, the, you know, the creation of plantations, there was a lot of private ownership of property and free enterprise, so you were able to create your own businesses, and again, you wanted to be a thriving plantation owner. With plantations being these large, lucrative farms, there was a high demand for labor, and so at first, it was indentured servants. You know, many people um, who own the land would pay for the passage of individuals from Europe to come over. So if you could not afford to pay your way to the new world, but you were willing to come, someone would pay your way over and you would work for them, typically for seven to nine years until your debt was paid off. It was extremely difficult. Um, many indentured servants did not survive um, living in the new world, whether that was because of the rigorous labor or their exposure to disease or lack of goods and resources. But if you were able to survive those seven to nine years as an indentured servant, you were then free to go on your own. And that's where, talking about the interior lands, a lot of that land was settled by former indentured servants. But indentured servants, the number of indentured servants started to go down. People um, 
found that life in Europe was getting a lot easier. There wasn't uh, as much competition for work as so many people were coming to the new world. Also, they heard about the struggles of being an indentured servant, and that scared many individuals. So this still created a problem for plantation owners because they needed a labor force. And so that is where slavery, again, is going to become um, the answer to that demand for a labor force. And um, within Virginia and in Jamestown, the first slaves will arrive on a Dutch ship in 1619. And so from there, the slave trade will expand beyond the southern region into all three regions of the 13 colonies. The social status within the South. So what makes up the social society? Um, your standing is based on your family status and ownership of land. Um, most power, social power, and even political power when we talk about politics is going to reside with the plantation owners. Um, so it is dominated. They define what is um, socially acceptable and what is the social hierarchy. Um, small farmers were the majority. They made up the majority of the population in the South, but the planters, those who own the plantations, control the economy and politics. So it was definitely a system of wealth, um, not a system of majority. So if you were looking at it in a tier, planters are on top, then small farmers, then women, then indentured servants, and slaves would be at the bottom tier of the hierarchy system. Also, your standing with the Church of England, also known as the Anglican Church, that was the primary religion of the South. Uh, while there were other religions that started to pop up within the Southern region, the Anglican Church and their ties to England were going to be most significant. And so this is just an image, you know, most plantations would have their own church on the plantation. Um, there wasn't a large social network in the South because the plantations were so spread out that oftentimes you did not go beyond your plantation. So your plantation became its own little village. Like I said before, the main religion is the Anglican religion that ties to the Church of England. So the Southern colonies feel a strong sense and connection to the mother country of England. And this is gonna be quite significant later on when we get to the Revolutionary War, because most of the loyalists are going to be in the South. Okay, the government structure within the South. Um, we will see the first elected assembly, so the Virginia House of Burgesses in the 1640s. Now, just want to clarify, this is not a governing body over the southern region. This is just one example. Um, the House of Burgesses was its own individual governing body within the Virginia colony. So this assembly made decisions for the colonists within Virginia. They had no power over colonists in North Carolina, South Carolina, Maryland, or so forth. So keep that in mind that it's only within Virginia. But this is the first instance where we see individuals kind of collectivizing and coming together and establishing a government system beyond the laws and regulations coming from the mother country of England. To be able to participate in the government, you had to own land. So again, the planting class dominated politics within Virginia and throughout the South. Um, so the Virginia House of Burgesses was established by the Virginia Company and encouraged people to come to the colony because they felt that they were civilized having their own, quote, government system there. So this is just a painting kind of emulating what the first House of Burgesses might have looked like. So some of the history behind uh, the southern region, of course, is the first permanent settlement. So Jamestown was established in 1607 by the Virginia Company of London. As I said before, it was an economic venture. The Virginia Company was looking to make money. It was their first permanent English settlement. It wasn't their first attempt. There was the Roanoke Colony, also referred to as the Lost Colony, um, that had been established in North Carolina. But to this day, we do not know what happened to those settlers that had established there. So um, Jamestown, you can see up in the corner there, that is the first uh, fort of Jamestown. Um, and it will struggle. Um, the Jamestown, they had a starving period because most of the individuals who tried to settle in Jamestown, the men who went, they were of middle to upper middle class. They never knew a hard day's work. They thought they were going to arrive and just find piles of gold and get rich quickly. They weren't willing to work and establish their housing and their food 
So they went through a bit of a starving period and vast majority of the original settlers of Jamestown died um, from starvation and um, succumbing to the elements, you know, harsh winter and lack of resources and even attacks by native populations. So they were going to need um, a strong order and that's where John Smith kind of came in to govern that original colony of Jamestown and he pretty much told you, you don't work, you don't eat. So these guys had to change their mindset to be able to survive. And so this is just a map kind of showing in the general area where Jamestown was located. So the motivation, what brought settlers over to the New World, particularly to Virginia and the establishing Southern region? Um, mostly, like I said, economic opportunity. The Cavaliers, if you ever wondered why uh, the University of Virginia's um, mascot is Cavaliers. Cavaliers were English nobility who were granted land grants in Virginia. So during the English Civil War, you might remember this from World II last year, Cavaliers were loyal to the crown when um, they were defeated by the Roundheads. Many of them feared for their lives, and so they gathered their wealth and resources and moved over into Virginia and the Southern region. And so we had a long, um, a large group of Cavaliers, and so that is why that is kind of the history background there that stuck with them. Um, and a representation here in Virginia. Many poor English immigrants came as indentured servants and they settled in the interior, which is you know, the Appalachian region today and the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. Okay, taking a look at the next region, which is a very different region from the Southern colonies. Um, the New England were established more for a religious basis. And so that's why we call it the Haven for Puritans. So within the New England colonies, we have Massachusetts. We have Maine there in parentheses because Maine was part of Massachusetts. So it's not Maine is not one of the original 13 colonies. It's part of Massachusetts. We have Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Hampshire as well. Um, rocky soil. We've got uh, really good harbors, you know, great for fishing, great for lumbering, but extremely cold winters. And so this is going, you know, the geography is really going to shape the social and economic structure of the New England region. Talking about the economy, um, this is, for the economy, there are very few farms. They tried farming at first because that's what many of the settlers knew, but the farming um, was not as lucrative. There's not gonna be large plantations like we found in the South. The farming in the New England region is mostly gonna be wheat, corn, cattle, hogs, and mostly subsistence farming, things to be able to take care of the family. But by 1760, they were producing one third of um, English ships and producing more iron than England. And so they are going to lean more towards shipbuilding, lumbering and fishing and shipping those items back to England to create a profit. And so this is where later on our industrial hub is naturally going to start to take place um, because the geography is going to have a major factor in shaping the development of their economy. So you can see here the natural harbors. You know, one of the major harbors in New England is Boston Harbor, which is going to have an essential point when we get to the Revolutionary War. Um, New England was very strict. It was established by the Puritans. And so the Puritans had a strong belief in values of hard work and thrift. Um, you were there for the greater good of New England. Um, so they wanted to make sure that, you know, as a Puritan, you were living your fullest, but giving your most to your community. And that was one of the reasons why the New England colonies prospered. And we'll talk more about the Puritans in detail in a moment. But some of the Puritan ideas, it was a crime to be drunk in society. There was no drinking. Um, it was a crime to swear. There was a crime of theft and to be idle. So if you seem to be, you know, kind of relaxing, there was no relaxing. There was no day off you are constantly working for the greater good of the colony. And so a very strict society, very simple, you did not have a lot of extravagance. And that was something, that's why they were called Puritans, is they wanted to purify the Church of England, um, purify them of the Catholic traditions that were still lingering um, in the Anglican Church. Um, they wanted things to be very simple. So the social standing. Um, where we talked about in the Southern colonies, social standing depended on land ownership and wealth. Here it is your standing with the church. 
church officials also held government positions. Um, so everyone went to church, everybody, all the time. Um, education was extremely important. This is why it's not, um, you know, it wasn't just by coincidence that a lot of the Ivy League schools like Harvard and Princeton and Yale are established in the New England region because education from the beginning was of primary importance to the New England settlers because they wanted their citizens to be able to read and interpret the Bible. So they're gonna be the first of the regions to establish a school system, an elementary school system for their children and so forth so that they're able to read and write to be able to interpret the Bible. Also, family is extremely important. Family was connected to the colony success. So unlike Jamestown, which was mostly settled by only men, when individuals came to New England, they were settled by families. So it was whole units that came to the New World because they felt if you had the backing and support of your family, that would allow the colony to thrive. So looking at the social structure, um, John Winthrop, who was the head of the Puritans, he had this idea of his city upon a hill, the model city, um, which is going to become the Massachusetts colony. He intended to come to create um, what he thought would be the model that others would replicate around the world. So religious-based, um, you know, highly organized, highly efficient. And so he was not tolerant of anybody who would question his authority or question the Puritan teaching. So it was a very strict society. Um, and so if there were individuals who started to dissent or disagree with the Puritans or the Puritan leaders, they oftentimes found themselves kind of pushed out of society. And one of the areas that created a lot of um, dissension and division amongst the Puritans was over the ability to vote um, and who governed the colony. Um, there was no religious tolerance within the New England colonies, particularly Massachusetts led by the Puritans. You could only practice the Puritan religion. They were not welcoming of other religions. So I kind of call it the Puritan way or the highway. And so when other individuals like Roger Williams wanted to separate church and state. He says, you know, it's not fair that individuals who are not of the Puritan faith have no voice um, within the government or within the um, community. He says, you know, that should not be the case. You should be able to separate those. Um, this kind of made him a mark of the Puritans as a dissenter and start to push him out. And so he was forced to leave Massachusetts and he's going to go to another region and establish his own colony, which will become Rhode Island. And so there we have the first concept of separation of church and state, that you do not have to incorporate religious teachings and religious leadership within your political structure as well. Another dissenter was Anne Hutchinson. Um, she preached that people could worship for themselves. They did not need church leaders to um, interpret or tell them what the Bible was uh, teaching or what God was thinking. Um, so this is where their education system kind of backfired on. They wanted people to be able to read and interpret the Bible, but they wanted the people to purely listen to the church leadership. So when Anne Hutchinson started to argue that, well, if you can read the Bible on your own, you can interpret it for yourself. You really don't need the church leadership to tell you what to think. Um, this kind of put a mark on her. And so she was banished from Massachusetts from saying that they don't need to uh, listen to their ministers. She at first went to Rhode Island with um, Roger Williams, but then is going to um, go and establish other um, colonies as well. And this is gonna be the beginnings of Connecticut. So again, the term Puritans comes from the concept that they wanted to purify the Anglican Church or the Church of England from its Catholic ways. There were still some Catholic practices that the Puritans did not like. So they felt that they were fulfilling God's um, calling through their hard work and their thrift by establishing their city upon a hill. But they were definitely um, very individual. 
Um, they were strong in their belief in God, and they felt that they were disconnected from England. And this is going to be extremely important because the seeds of the revolution are going to be started and really planted in New England and amongst the Puritans who felt, well, we're no longer part of England. We left. You know, we were being persecuted, we were being attacked by the Church of England, so we left and established our own colony. And they really start to plant that seeds that, well, we don't really need to listen to, um, to England anymore. And, you know, there are, you know, there's an ocean between us. And so that seed is going to be planted very early. The government, okay, and the government structure. We see here kind of that first signed contract. So there are two groups that we see established in New England. There are the Puritans with John Winthrop in his city upon a hill. And then we have the Pilgrims. Now we associate the Pilgrims with the first Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving and Plymouth Rock. But the Pilgrims were a separatist group. They wanted to separate um, from the Church of England. You know, so the Puritans wanted to purify it. The Pilgrims wanted to separate from it. And so they boarded their ship, the Mayflower, and they were actually intended to go to Virginia. They were going to be, they were backed by the Virginia Company, the same company that backed the establishment of Jamestown. So they were not intended to go to Massachusetts or to Plymouth, but they hit a storm. It took them off path. And so they headed more north and they landed at Plymouth Rock. Well, when they got off course, they're like, well, what are we going to do? We don't have any correspondence. They felt bound to the Virginia Company, but now they didn't know what to do. They were on their own. And so there were individuals, there were pilgrims that were on the ship, but there were also other individuals, other people who were just coming to the New World on um, the Mayflower Compact. And to survive, they all needed each other. And when they got off course, many people of the pilgrims group started to see the other individuals kind of you know, maybe going back on their ideas or going back on their agreements with the Virginia Company. And so they took it upon themselves to create this covenant community. They drafted rather quickly um, the components of the Mayflower Compact that they all agreed to work together so that they could thrive. And so that was kind of the first structured government and idea of a separate government and a government of the people um, being established there with the Mayflower. Um, the government practice in New England was different, you know, from the southern colonies. The southern colonies was ba you know, based on wealth and land ownership, so the plantation class um, having the vast majority of the power. Um, in the New England colonies, it was more of a uh, direct democracy. So all church members, who again were men, women did not have a vote here or a voice at this time, um, but all church members, so male church members, had a vote. And so they would hold local town meetings, mostly in the church, um, but that is where they established their political structure um, and their political ideas. And so the, only the church members could vote. And as I said before, there was no freedom of religion. And so this is uh, an example of them signing the Mayflower Compact in 1620, obviously a painting created after. So as I said before, the Pilgrims landed in Plymouth in 1620. It was not their intended purpose. Uh, the Massachusetts Bay, though, was a planned settlement by the Puritans, by John Winthrop, and they landed in Boston. They were very successful. Um, John Winthrop learned from the struggles of Jamestown, so he made sure they had plenty of equipment, plenty of resources, so they did not experience a starving period in the same instance that the settlers of Jamestown did. And that is a picture of John Winthrop there in the center, kind of giving his sermon of, about what he considered to be, quote, the city upon a hill. So the motivation for both the Puritans and the Pilgrims was they wanted freedom from religious persecution. They were attacked back in England because of their criticisms of the Church of England. And so instead of converting to and accepting the Church of England the way they were, they saw this as an opportunity to bring their teachings and their ideas to so again, that model society is the backbone for New England. All right, the last section that we're going to take a look at here are the middle colonies. And so if you, you know, know the story of Goldilocks, you know, the extremes between Papa Bear and Mama Bear, one was too hot, one was too cold, and Baby Bear was just right. 
And so that's kind of what the middle colonies will be. It's a blend of some of the Southern teachings and upbringing and ideas that define the Southern region, as well as the um, extreme and restricting components of New England combined to kind of make the middle ground for the middle colonies. So within the middle colonies, we have Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and Delaware. Based on their economy is going to be kind of a mix of the two. So you bring the shipbuilding, the small scale farming and trading that we see established in the New England colonies. Um, some of their major port cities are going to be um, New York City, Philadelphia out of Pennsylvania. Now Baltimore is part of the South, but it is going to be a major trading hub for them. So their commercial and their trade. Trade is key to the middle colonies. And it makes sense. It's the middle ground between the two. You've got more of your industrial aspects and manufacturing in New England, more of your agricultural aspects within the South. So the middle colonies is going to be that middle ground. Their society is also very flexible. Um, they take out the extreme of the Puritans. So many people who maybe started in New England um, and just did not want to abide by the strict um, code of conduct that the Puritans implemented in New England, they started to travel a little bit south to the middle colonies. Um, there is a lot of religious tolerance and openness. It was also the most diverse region. So there are many individuals who come from many walks of life within the middle colonies. Um, so their social structure is very flexible. It's not going to be based on religion and it's not necessarily going to be based on land ownership either. Um, so these were your artisans, so skilled artisans, entrepreneurs, small farmers, there's quite a variety of people within there. As I said before, multiple religious groups. So we have the Quakers who are going to be settling in Pennsylvania. They themselves are being persecuted um, in England. And so we'll talk about William Penn. He established Pennsylvania for the Quakers. Um, but they were, since they were so open and needed individuals to settle in their region, they allowed any religion. So we see a large Jewish population in New York, rise of Presbyterians in New Jersey, and religion did not define the government within this region. So they could live um, amongst each other without fighting about which religion was more dominant than another. So looking at some of the government, so originally the middle colonies was not dominated by the English. Um, we had English in the south, English in the north, um, but we have the Dutch who are going to have a stronghold in the middle. So um, they had their colony known as New Netherland um, that was established with the port city with a, that we today know as New York. So um, New Netherland is going to be um, is going to need a lot of settlers, and this is what increased such diversity within the region. They welcomed Germans, they welcomed uh, French, they welcomed Scandinavians, because they needed a large population to help their colony to thrive. Um, they were governed by royal governors, but eventually the Dutch will be attacked by the English. The English wanted to kind of control the entire coastline, um, and so they needed the middle region to be able to connect the New England and the southern colonies. And so the Duke of York is going to march into New Netherlands and take them over and he will change it. So the New Netherlands no longer be known as New Netherlands, but known as New York. And so that is how we have the state of New York today. Um, so as I said before, they were settled by the Dutch West India Company that was established there. And one of the thriving things economically for them was the fur trade. And so for the middle colonies, just to kind of wrap up here, the motivation to settle in the middle colonies was that idea of religious uh, freedom. Um, we know the Puritans were not tolerant of any other type of religion. And in the South, while there wasn't as strict um, adherence to religion, there was still a very strong Anglican tendency in the South. So individuals of different religious backgrounds or maybe who did not want to abide by the strict religious codes of New England and this um, connection with the Anglican Church in the South, they sought refuge within the middle colonies. The vast uh, diversity within their economic system, you know, traders, artisans, um, you know, they kind of stuck towards the middle, the natural harbors. You know, most people just came in off the ships and didn't really move far. It was difficult to move, so settling in the middle colonies was easy. Also the diverse population, very welcoming of individuals not of English descent, 
but other countries as well, um, which will have a large influencing factor within that region.